Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be you, now and forever. Amen. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Nehemiah. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorably, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has said, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be made that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The word of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today 
the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, one of the more popular New Year's resolutions that I hear among us uh, church folks is to try and read through the Bible in the course of a year. It's a really great thing to do, so I can't commend that to you enough as a New Year's resolution to make. But if we're speaking honestly, the Bible can be a really hard book to get into sometimes. So if you just open the Old Testament and start to read, you'll find those lists of nearly impossible to pronounce names. There were two of those actually in our Nehemiah reading this morning that for your sake and for the sake of those reading, you're welcome, Will Henry, we cut that out. You can go read it, but they're really hard to pronounce. And then there's all the dietary rules and regulations and all the instructions for worship and how to build a temple and all the things that the priests wear. It can be hard to wrap your mind around. And then in the New Testament, we find even though it's written closer to our times, it's still an ancient text written to an ancient culture that's kind of different from our own. So even the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus' life, which are really the best place to start when you begin to read the Bible, even they can leave us scratching our heads sometimes. Because first of all, there, there are four of them, there's four different ones, and each of them was written by a different author, and each of those authors arranges the events of Jesus' life in a specific way and puts their own emphasis on Jesus' ministry. But what's important to remember when we do read one of those four Gospels, be it Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, is that these differences between them aren't haphazard, but they're intentional. So every little detail in each of the four Gospels, from which stories the author chose to put in and leave out, or to what order they put those stories in, all of those were an intentional choice that they made to most effectively tell their readers the gospel, the good news about who Jesus is and what it is he has done for us. So whenever we read any of those four gospels, it's important for us to remember this too, that no story or detail is incidental to what the author is trying to say and where each of those stories sits in the gospel actually matters. And that brings us to our reading this morning from the gospel according to Luke. So here, pretty early in his gospel, Luke tells us at the very start, actually, in chapter 1, that he's setting out to write an orderly account of the ministry of Jesus. And because we're actually going to be kind of reading through Luke's gospel pretty much every Sunday between now and the beginning of Lent, before we look at our passage today, I want to take a second to kind of orient ourselves to what's already happened in Luke's gospel and in his account of Jesus' life. So... In Luke chapter 1 and 2, we get the birth story of Jesus, and we get the only account of Jesus' childhood in all the Gospels, which is when his parents managed to lose him on their way back from Jerusalem to their home in Galilee. Then in Luke 3, it's really all about John the Baptist and his ministry, and Jesus' own baptism. And then Luke gives us this genealogy of Jesus that takes all the way back to Adam. So in Luke 4, it's where Jesus' ministry begins. First, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and then we pick up with our passage today, where Luke very briefly tells us about this ministry that Jesus has of teaching and healing throughout Galilee, and then he returns to his hometown of Nazareth, where he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he reads the book of Isaiah, where it tells about the ministry of the Messiah, and says to everyone who's there that this scripture is actually fulfilled 
in him that very day. So based on what we've already talked about and the fact that Luke actually tells us that he's writing an orderly account of Jesus' life, that he's thinking about where he's putting things, the question before us is, why is this story here? And why does Luke go into such detail about it? That teaching and healing ministry at the beginning of our passage, some scholars say, could have lasted up to two years and we get two sentences for it. Luke gives this one day a lot of text. And from what I can tell, Luke put this passage here and provides so much detail because it's right here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And right here at the beginning of his ministry, we see Jesus actually just telling us exactly what it is he came to do. Meaning then that as we read the rest of Luke's gospel, we're supposed to understand all of that in light of what Jesus is saying to us here. So Jesus is telling us what his life and his ministry are all about, which is a pretty good indication that we probably should pay some attention to what he's saying, not just in the pages of scripture, but what he's saying to us today as well. So Jesus walks into the synagogue in Nazareth and he picks up the scroll and he picks a part of Isaiah to read. It's from Isaiah chapter 61. And he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So what does this passage tell us about Jesus's earthly ministry? Well, first we get a clear idea of who Jesus is, that God's spirit is on him, meaning that what Jesus says and does is the will of his father. It is the will of God. As we read in the letter to the Hebrews, Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. So when we see Jesus doing things, we see who God is what God cares about. And then adding to this is the idea that Jesus is anointed by God for the work that he is going to do. So both the titles we often refer to Jesus by, Messiah, the Hebrew version, and Christ, the Greek version, they both simply mean the one who is anointed. So Jesus was anointed. He was the anointed one, the one chosen by God before the foundation of the world to come and to save us. And Jesus came to tell good news of God's mercy and forgiveness to the poor and to the downtrodden, inviting them to come and buy from God's storehouses of grace without money. So just look at Jesus' own family who was poor, or his disciples who were normal, pretty poor people, or those he interacted with throughout his ministry, the lepers and those who were sick who had no way to make money other than to sit and to beg for it. Those are the people who Jesus spent so much time with. But it wasn't just those physically poor that Jesus cared about, because Jesus preached good news to the spiritually poor, too. He challenged the Pharisees and the other religious leaders and the rich young ruler, though they didn't really listen to what he was saying and rejected his message. And it's no accident that Jesus says, blessed are the poor in a sermon in Luke's gospel, and also, Blessed are the poor in spirit in Matthew's gospel, because both of those things are true, and they're played out in his ministry. And Jesus came to bring healing. So yes, the recovery of the sight to the blind. He literally heals blind people and gives them their sight back, but it's more than that. From the blind, to the lepers, to the paralytics, to those who are invalids and crippled, and even to a dead man, Jesus brought healing and life. And again, not just physical healing, but spiritual healing too. Jesus came to free the captives and all who were oppressed. And throughout his ministry, of course, Jesus goes around and sets people free from spiritual captivity and oppression, casting out demons and putting the forces of evil to flight before him. And Jesus' greatest act of liberation, of course, came when he died and rose again to free us from sin and death. And Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor because through his dying and through his rising again, all of us, every single person who comes to the Father through Jesus finds God's acceptance and favor. 
In Jesus, it is always the year of the Lord's favor. And of course, while these words from Isaiah are true of Jesus' work long ago that we find in the pages of Scripture, they're still true about what Jesus is doing today. These are still the things that Jesus does. Jesus is still in the business of bringing the good news of God's mercy to the physically poor, the materially poor, and the spiritually poor alike. And Jesus is still bringing healing. So just the other week, I had someone come up to me and tell me that a while ago they came to our Wednesday midweek healing service a few years ago, that one of us, I have no idea which member of the clergy it was, put hands on him and anointed him with oil and prayed for him and that he was healed. I was totally taken aback by this because it's really easy to forget that Jesus still does these kind of things. Think about the week after week when I do that service and don't really grasp the fact that Jesus really can and does heal people. Jesus also brings healing, though, to hearts that have been broken or wounded or bereaved because of sin and its horrific effects on us and the world. He brings healing to marriages and to families and to relationships that have been disrupted by brokenness and sin. And Jesus heals our spiritual blindness and hard-heartedness, and he gives us eyes to see the world as he sees the world and a new heart to go along with it. And Jesus is still at work setting free those in captivity to sin and powers of evil, freeing people from oppression, both spiritual and physical. Jesus laid down his life as a ransom in order to buy freedom for us. And if Jesus sets you free, you are truly free. So I'd imagine that many of us sitting here today or who are watching online, that we're here because it one time or another, in one way or another, we've experienced this kind of work that Jesus does in our lives. Or we've seen it happen in the lives of someone else. But maybe we were met by Jesus in our own spiritual or even material poverty. Or maybe we've been healed in some way by Jesus' presence in our lives. Or maybe Jesus has set us free from spiritual oppression and captivity to sin. But the thing that really stuck out to me when sitting with this passage and reflecting on Jesus' mission and his power to fulfill it even today is just how often it is that I forget it. How easy it is for me to forget all of it. How in the kind of day-to-day things of life where task lists pile up and you take out the garbage again and wash the dishes again and drive in traffic again and again, And again, that we lose sight of all the things that Jesus has done for us. How I lose sight of all the things that Jesus has healed within me and the things that he's freed me from in the past. And even of his power and his desire to heal and deliver me now, today. And for those of us who have tasted and seen God's goodness in Jesus, the words that Jesus read from Isaiah are really a call to us, a call to remember how faithful and powerful our Savior has been and will continue to be, and to remember the things that he's done for us, to remember the healing and freedom that Jesus has already brought us, but also to see maybe afresh that this work is possible even today. And for those who have not known Jesus in this way, he's saying something to you too which is that he's inviting you today to come to him, to come with whatever it is you may lack, whatever it is that may be weighing you down in order to be set free and made well, to feel the peace of God's favor that he already has secured for you. So I'll close with this thought, and I'm mostly talking to us churchy folks here again. This message about Jesus that we have, the gospel, the good news, It isn't just some idea, and it's really not just a religious platitude. It's the power of God for salvation. It's the good news that even in our poverty and in our sickness and in our captivity, God thought that we were worthy of coming and dying for it. It's the truth that Jesus shed his blood to set us free, that there's power in his blood to make us well and to make us whole. 
And it's easy enough for us who already know the gospel to forget how incredible it is. It's why we actually need to be reminded of it again and again and again. It's why we come here week after week. But what's also true is that the world around us, whether it knows it or not, is absolutely starving for this message, starving for the good news about Jesus. So as we more and more come to know the goodness of God and the freedom and healing of Jesus ourselves, may we also share it more and more with a world that is desperately in need of it. And with that in mind, I want to pray again our collect for today, which I think perfectly sums up this point. So let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we in the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Please stand and let us respond in faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the God of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. For Foley, our Archbishop, for Neil, our Bishop, for the clergy of the cathedral, and for the clergy and the people of the diocese and congregation. We pray for these churches in our diocese, Christ Church Anglican, Savannah, Georgia, the Table Fellowship, Jacksonville, Church of the Apostles, Montrose, Alabama, Christ the King, St. Augustine. We pray also for the Bishop Search Process. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church, and so guide the minds of those who shall choose the Bishop for the Diocese, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will preach the gospel, care for your people, equip us for your ministry, and lead us forth in fulfillment of the Great Commission. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, for Bobby Carruth and his work with Kairos and Celebrate Recovery, Jason White as he prepares to lead Kairos weekend in June, Father Wesley Owens as his work in the Good News Outreach was women's reentry and for incarcerated men and women to feel Christ's love and forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, especially the church in Haiti, Afghanistan, and Miramar, Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, 
for those in authority and for, in public service, especially Joe, our president, and Ron, our governor. Lord, in your mercy. You are we ask for deliverance from the COVID-19 virus, for the perfect love that casts out fear, and for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any adversity, especially Morgan, Hank Lawrence, Tom McCaleb, Phyllis Nelson, Keith, Bonnie, Lynn, Ben Allen, Bart McFarland, Patty Howard, Joan, Eric Marshall, Anna Mahaffey, Vicki Spitzer, Morgan Provat, Mariana, and all health care workers. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in certain hope of the resurrection, especially Keith McNeil, and for all the departed, with thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess the sins Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners if anyone sins. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Please arise. Now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with signs of the peace we have in Christ Jesus. Good morning. Good morning, St. Peter's. Good morning. Welcome. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you especially. Uh, if you would all please sign the little black book and pass it on down. You know the drill. Um, as a reminder, please reserve your spot for Wednesday night dinner so we can plan accordingly. And there's a link in the e-keys to sign up, or you can just call the office and let us know you plan to be there. That helps us plan out the meals uh, for Wednesday nights. Uh, next week on January 30th, the Bloodmobile is coming, so um, the vampires are at the door and your number's up, so please. Um, registration is available for the women's mini retreat, and there's a link sent to all the women via email in the parish uh, CT. And if you have questions, and let me just say, uh, registration is, as I understand it, is about half full right now, which means that it's filling up quickly. Ladies, you do not want to miss this. Susan Yates is one of the 
uh, most sought after, if not the most sought after Anglican women speaker in North America. Um, and it's a big, big deal that she's here. So please don't let that opportunity pass you by. Um, quick note, I uh, just found this morning, the, the Mary Martha vacation home drawing begins today. And there's stuff in your keys, lots of other stuff in the keys. Pay attention to it. Um, but I'm going to yield the remainder of my time. Uh, Miss Jamie Brown, director of a women's pregnancy center, is here, and we've asked her to come up and give us a little talk. Imagine you are sitting at your kitchen table, and across from you sits your daughter, or your granddaughter, or maybe your niece. She has just shared with you that she is pregnant. In her eyes, you see fear, confusion, hopelessness. You try to tamp down your own frustration and anger. You're disappointed because you know that she is happily settled in her last year, second year of college, um, headed to a career in law, and she has established close friendships with her church and her sorority. She's excelling in her school soccer team. But now what? She is searching your face for answers or any sign of judgment or condemnation. She tells you that she's always thought abortion was okay for someone else, but not for her personally. But now she would have so much to lose, her soccer scholarship, her housing and social community. She couldn't remain in the sorority if she's carried a baby to term. Who's going to care for her baby while she studies? She's looking to you for answers and reassurance. What do you do? How do you respond? Those are tough questions. Young women and men and their partners facing these and other challenges cross our thresholds daily. We are trained, prepared, and eager to be the whisper of hope in the midst of their chaos. We carefully walk through each of her options, parenting, adoption, and abortion. We encourage them to take their time to carefully examine what each option would look like in their lives. We offer them an ultrasound to help dismiss the myth that this is just a tissue with cardiac activity. They can see for themselves the baby's beating heart that the Lord purposely placed in her womb. Eighty percent of our moms and dads will choose life, particularly after viewing truth in the ultrasound. Last year, the Lord rescued 303 babies from death. To help put this in perspective for you, in six years, that will be 15 new kindergarten classes full of precious little ones. To God be all that glory. For those who choose to carry a parent, we offer material assistance through our Belly Boutique, ongoing counseling, and access to community resources, all at no cost to them. If our moms choose to abort their baby, we come alongside them with her with after abortion care. Often women are emotionally devastated by terminating their pregnancy, and we want to be the resource that helps them with their healing. AWPC also offers STD testing in our Mosaic Sexual Health Clinic located directly next door to the mega Planned Parenthood building. This program affords us the opportunity to test and educate men and women on their sexual health. And most importantly, we're able to share the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we do at all three of our locations. The gospel is foundational to every aspect of this ministry and what a joy it is to see the fruit blossom as our volunteer men and women counselors lead our clients to Christ. We are seeing an unprecedented number awakening up to the hunger for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last year, 108 men and women made a profession of faith in our counseling rooms. That's double what we've seen in years past. So to God be the glory for that as well. So the challenge is, how do we connect these new believers into a faith-growing community? Most of the men and women we see would be considered in the margins of society. Many come to us abused, trafficked, economically disadvantaged or damaged by a previous church encounter. They would never seek out a sanctuary in a church perceived to be full of self-righteous and judgmental people.
The gap between the church and the unchurched is enormous. How do we build that bridge? Our clients who live in the margin don't want fixing. They want love and friendship. The trust begins to grow only when they see that we truly care for them. And that takes an investment of time. Ministries like ours depend on the body of Christ in every aspect of our operation. Our hope is to call on the church to go. Go outside of the church walls with us to some of the darkest places you can imagine. Our clients are no different than us. We all are desperately in need of a savior. God loves the heart of his, of his bride, the church, perhaps never more so than when he sees us answer his call to action. So step out the, outside the walls with me and trust that he will equip you to your calling. Thank you, St. Peter's, for your heart for the unborn. Thank you, Ms. Jamie. There'll be a Q&A with Jamie and, and a couple others uh, between services down in the parish hall. Please avail yourself of that. Remember the word of God to us. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own glorious light. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. When we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. For in the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep peace. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this table of our school, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to be flesh. Behold.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
This morning we send forth Ralph and Kay to take communion to Bart, to Bob and Marjorie to take communion to Dottie, and Bruce and Francis to take communion to Louise and Walter. May you all take the prayers of all of us as you take Christ's presence to those who await his grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are members of the body of the Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory. Be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let everything you do be done in love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.